like and subscribe, and leave a comment below. Beyond Antarctica, Chapter 39 The air around the crew was thick with tension as they stood by the fallen giant, still knocked out from his fall. His colossal frame loomed ominously against the backdrop. Tony was the first to break the silence. We need to tie him up and question him, John. We need to know what we're really dealing with, Bob scowled. You have no idea how dangerous this thing is. Even blind, if he frees himself, it's over. He'd rip through us like paper. Do you want that on your hands? John stood still for a moment, processing the argument. Why do we need to question him, Tony? What's left to learn? Tony stepped closer. We need to know if there are more of them on this island. They're true numbers. We can't sit here blind to the threat. How can we protect these kids and sanctuary if we don't even know what's out there? John nodded slowly, his gaze shifting from Tony to Bob, then to the giant. You make a good argument. I can't leave these kids here just for them to become food for more of these aggressive meat-eating giants in a few weeks. We've barely survived this one. Todd crossed his arms. You know we can't rely on the local giants. They're far too docile, and without their help, I agree with Bob. It's just too dangerous. We have no choice but to kill him. John's jaw tightened as he made his decision. All right, we'll question him, but before we do, we need to make sure he's secured. If he breaks free, John's voice trailed off with the unspoken consequences hanging in the air. Everyone! John barked out, commanding the attention of the scattered group around them. Gather as many vines as you can find. We need to secure this giant, and I mean secure him tight. Todd, you're in charge of building ballistas. I want one on each tower, able to swivel 360 degrees so they can cover every inch of sanctuary. And for now, aim all of them at the giant. If he tries anything, we're ready. Todd says nice plan already mentally sketching the crude weapons, giving a firm nod. If you want them in a couple hours, it'll be tight, but I'll get it done, John. These things will be rough, but deadly. Good, John replied. Take what you need, but remember, we're racing the clock here. With that, the crew erupted into a whirlwind of organized chaos. Bob quickly took charge of the team securing the giant. Vines were twisted and knotted around the giant's limbs, anchored deep into the ground with thick wooden stakes driven into the earth. Every pull and knot was calculated. Every spike hammered in with brute force to ensure the giant wouldn't have a chance to break free. The more vines they secured, the less fear the children felt, until he was a mere shadow of the threat he once was. Meanwhile, Todd gathered as many hands as he could to help him build the ballistas. They scavenged the surrounding forest, chopping down large trees and lashing them together to form the crude but functional weapons. It wasn't elegant, but the ballistas began to take shape. Massive wooden constructs, each fitted with large bolts and mounted on a swivel. As the crew worked under Todd's guidance, the makeshift weapons slowly came together. John watched with a sense of urgency gnawing at him. The ballistas looked like something out of ancient times, crude in their construction but menacing in their purpose. Each one stood tall, ready to rain down destruction on anything that dared to breach their walls, Todd said, climbing down from a tower. There, not perfect, but they are large enough to take down anything I have seen so far that might threaten us. John nodded. We'll need more guard towers, he said, turning to Jackson, who had been watching the operation unfold. You'll have to reinforce the defenses. These towers and ballistas will be your lifeline if more of those giants come. Over the next week, you should build many more. Jackson's eyes scanned the efforts of those around them. We'll build more, he said, many more. Bob, filled with doubt, stepped forward. John, I know we're doing everything we can, but is the risk really worth the reward? We're risking everyone's lives here, these kids, us, all because we want to question a giant. Is it really worth it? John turned to face him, his expression serious. That's exactly why we have to do this. If we don't figure out what's out there, that means we're flying blind, and flying blind usually means death. We're not just securing sanctuary for today. We're trying to protect it for the long haul. John yelled out for them to continue their work, securing the giant with more vines than seemed necessary, making sure the stakes were driven deep into the ground. As night began to fall, the final preparations were made. Todd walked over to John. The ballistas are set. I know they're not pretty, but they'll do their job. 
John placed a hand on his friend's shoulder. That's all I asked of you. Let's just hope we don't have to use them. Bob crossed his arms, glancing at the bound giant. I just hope that we get some answers and this was worth it. John glanced at the towering, unconscious figure with vines pulling tight across his limbs. We'll get our answers, he said, his voice filled with determination. One way or another, the crew stood ready, weapons in hand, waiting for what the morning would bring. Would the giant speak, or would they be forced to kill him before they could learn his secrets? Only time would tell, but for now, they had done all they could. The stakes, both literal and figurative, were in the ground, and the fate of sanctuary hung in the balance. The rest of the night dragged on painfully slow. John lay awake. The looming threat of the captured giant weighed heavy, keeping him restless. Finally, unable to bear the suspense, he joined Bob, who was stationed near one of the newly constructed ballistas, calibrating it in the pre-dawn gloom. I take it you couldn't sleep either, Bob muttered without looking up, carefully adjusting the makeshift sights on the giant wooden contraption. Not with that thing out there, John replied. He joined Bob, watching as he fired a bolt towards a makeshift target set up on one of the terraces. The enormous bolt whistled through the air before sinking deep into the target with a satisfying thud. Bob moved to the front of the weapon, checking the marks he'd etched into the wood. I'm marking them for distance, Bob explained, gesturing to the notches on the sight. The more accurate these things are, the better chance we've got. John nodded, appreciating the precision. They needed every advantage they could muster if things went wrong. They continued in silence for a while, testing the range and making adjustments. He's waking up, a voice called from the walls. We've got movement. John and Bob scrambled to a makeshift platform near the giant. The huge creature stirred, the vines that held him pulling taut as he shifted. A few of them frayed and snapped and Bob instinctively stepped back. We mean you no harm. John said loudly, trying to sound calm as the giant's head jerked toward the sound. His sightless eyes roamed and his chest heaved as he struggled. Free me! The giant roared, his voice like thunder shaking the ground. He thrashed violently and more vines snapped under the strain. This is a new level of cruelty from you little ones. Release me or kill me! John, in an attempt to calm him, we secured you for everyone's safety, he said firmly. It's temporary. We need to talk before I can release you. The giant's face twisted in rage. I can't see. You blinded me, he bellowed, his voice filled with fury as he strained again with more vines snapping. His blood-curdling scream sent shivers down John's spine. He motioned to Kim, signaling for her to move the younger children farther away. Kim hurried to gather the children, pulling them away from the tent scene. Get to a tower, Todd, John barked. Tony! Help him with the ballistas. If this thing breaks free, don't hesitate to fire. Todd and Tony rushed to the nearest tower, clambering up to the ballistas while the giant, his chest heaving, ceased his thrashing, a grimace settling over his face. Free me or kill me, he demanded, his voice suddenly quieter but no less dangerous. We need answers first, John said, keeping his distance. You have my word. If you give us what we need, we'll talk about freeing you. The giant grunted with his lips curling in disgust. How many more like you are on this island? John asked. The giant exhaled heavily, his jaw clenching. I'm the last, he finally growled. You killed my brothers, but my father and his army. They'll cross the great sea soon enough. John's stomach churned. Your father? he asked. The giant sneered. Yes, there's no food left, no game to hunt. Soon, the rest of the clan will come. They'll swim all at once to outnumber the leviathans that hunt the seas. John, trying to process the gravity of the situation. When will they arrive? He asked, glancing nervously at Bob, who looked equally shaken. The giant laughed bitterly. We were to scout ahead and map out any threats, and they would follow in days. And when they do, they'll claim this island as their own. You will be crushed, and your little city will fall. John stood there, processing the giant's words. His mind burdened with the weight of the situation. These warrior giants were making dangerous moves, crossing perilous waters, abandoning what little remained of their homes, and for what? A desperate hope to find sustenance on this new island. 
but why not fish the seas instead of putting your lives at risk with such a swim? John asked. You came from an island. There's an endless supply of fish in the waters. Why risk swimming all the way here? The giant let out a deafening laugh, the sound rumbling like thunder through sanctuary. It was a harsh, mocking laugh, one that sent shivers through those still nearby. The giant's eyes narrowed. You cannot fish for the same reason you cannot swim, the giant sneered. There are leviathans in these waters, beasts beyond your imagination, little one. They are ancient, enormous, and hungry. They hide and wait, just beneath the waves, patient and ever watchful. No one dares venture too close to the beach. Those who do, his voice dropped lower, taking on a deadly seriousness. Those who do are never seen again. John's breath hitched as he tried to comprehend the magnitude of what he was being told. Leviathans, he echoed. The giant's lips curled into a sneer as he continued. The leviathans, they will beach themselves for a good meal, devour all they find and retreat back to the depths. We do not challenge the sea anymore. It is no longer a hunting ground. It is a graveyard. John stared at the giant, realizing just how desperate these creatures were. The sea had become a death sentence, but this was about hunger, and that hunger had driven the giants to risk everything to survive, forcing them to overcome their fear of the sea and make the swim. But, John pressed further, wasn't there once a city of people like us on your island? I heard stories. Were they not able to work with you? The giants' laughter returned, but it was darker now edged with bitterness, not for a very long time, he scoffed. There were once little people, yes, but no longer. We freed ourselves from their lies and manipulations. They promised us prosperity, safety, harmony, all lies. They sought to control us, to use us, like cattle, but we rose up against them. The giant's eyes flickered with a grim pride. Our island, it was once like this one. Lush jungles, plenty of wild creatures, rivers that ran strong and deep. But those times are long gone. Our island is a desert now. The jungles are gone, stripped bare. The rivers ran dry. Most of the life that thrived there is dead. John's throat tightened as he pictured the desolation. An entire island, once thriving, reduced to nothing more than a barren wasteland. He could almost feel the despair in the giant's voice. They had lived through it, the slow death of their home, watching it crumble under the weight of their own survival. And now they were here, ready to repeat the cycle. Is that what awaits us here? John asked, his voice low, more to himself than to the giant. Will this place suffer the same fate? The giant's grin returned, but this time it was filled with malice. You think you can stop it, little one? He shook his head, almost pitying John. This island, too, will die just like the others. The jungles will burn, the rivers will dry, and the beasts will flee or be hunted. My people will claim it, take what they need, and leave it to rot. That is the way of things. John clenched his fists, feeling the hopelessness clawing at him. This was about fighting for the future of sanctuary. Yes, but the question was, how long could they hold off an enemy this determined, and what would they need to sacrifice in order to do so? The giant continued, your little city will crumble, your people will fight and die, and in the end, all that will remain is dust, as he laughed in their direction. John took a deep breath, fighting back the dread. What if I told you we could live in peace together, we could help each other? The giant's laughter rang out once again, colder this time. Peace, with you, with the little liars and deceivers. My father will conquer this land, and you'll feel his wrath, little one. Bob stepped forward. If your father's coming, maybe we'll use you as leverage to keep us safe. A hostage, he suggested, glancing at John. The giant's lips curled into a mocking grin. If he sees me bound by the likes of you, little ones, he'll kill me himself. John turned to Jackson. We need the help of the other giants. Send someone to get them. Now, hours passed. Just when it seemed they would be left without help, the familiar face of a local giant peered over the wall. Slowly, a dozen of the docile giants entered the sanctuary, with their eyes fixed on the bound warrior. John held up a hand to greet them. The other giants grew restless, their low, rumbling moans vibrating through the air like a haunting chant. 
filling sanctuary with a feeling of sadness. Their huge frames moved uneasily, with their gazes locked on the warrior giant bound to the ground, helpless. It was a sight they clearly could not bear. One of the giants, the tallest among them, turned toward John, his sorrow-filled eyes glistening with what seemed like tears. Slowly, the giant fell to his knees. His head dropped in sorrow, and with his hands gesturing first toward the bound warrior and then back at John, he let out a pained moan, a sound so deep it resonated in John's chest. It was a moan of accusation, of disbelief, as if to say, how could you do this? John felt a knot tighten in his stomach. He watched the giant's face twist with emotion and instinctively he knelt down to draw in the dirt, trying to explain. He sketched a picture of the warrior giant, then added children cowering beneath him, the very children the giant had tried to devour. He looked up at the giant, hoping the simple image would make his point clear. But before John could finish, the giant wiped the dirt clean with a single swipe of his finger, shaking his head in disapproval. Then, with his fingernail, the giant quickly drew his own pictation in the dirt, depicting a giant slain or people fleeing. Then he sketched another image, a giant bound in ropes. With a swift motion, the giant erased the image, repeating the process over and over as if to say, kill us or run, but never bind us or imprison them. Bob, standing beside John, muttered under his breath, I think he's telling us we could have ran away or defended ourselves or even killed him, but tying him up, that's a violation of their belief system and is wrong on a different level. John's heart sank. He could feel the weight of their ancient customs pressing down on him, customs he didn't fully understand. He mumbled under his breath as he scratched more symbols in the dirt. The warrior giant tried to kill us, to murder your kin, and you're mad that we kept him alive for questioning. Frustrated, he scuffed the dirt, wiping away his attempts at communication. John shouts out loud, how can I possibly explain that we needed answers? That keeping the warrior giant alive wasn't about cruelty. It was about learning what kind of threat they were truly up against. How can I draw that in the dirt? He asked Bob. Bob leaned in with a grim smile. You don't. There is no way to draw that. They're not going to understand, John. John glanced up at the other giants with their mournful eyes still locked on him. The air felt thick with sorrow. Slowly, he looked up at the giant who had pleaded with him. His mind raced, but he knew words were useless now. With a heavy sigh, John dropped to one knee, lowering his head in submission, offering the only apology he could, a gesture of respect. But the giants waved him off, moving in to free the warrior giant from his restraints. Bob's heart sank as the vines were cut, and the towering figure stood to his full height as he let out a menacing roar that filled the air. And without a word, they turned, carrying him away from the sanctuary. Just before they exited, one of the local giants stayed behind, kneeling before John. The giant tapped his chest, then pointed to the warrior giant and back to himself, as if promising to handle the situation. Bob stepped closer to John, his voice low. I think they want to deal with him in their own way. John nodded slowly, but doubt gnawed at him. They didn't give us much choice, did they? He said, watching the procession head toward the valley below. Jackson nodded as John barked out his orders, already mentally running through the logistics. Double the defenses, he muttered. More towers, more ballistas. We'll need extra hands for construction, and they must work fast. Jackson looked up, already planning to gather as many of the older kids as possible to help with the fortifications. There was no time to waste. John took a deep breath, scanning the crowd of worn faces around him. I need volunteers, he said. We're forming a scouting party. It's not going to be easy, and it's not going to be safe. We need to gather supplies for an extended trip and head to the coast. We need to scout out what we're dealing with, see what kind of threat is coming, and what options we have. If it comes to it, we may have to use the ship to move the people to the continent to escape the giants. It will take a lot of trips, but it's an option. The group exchanged nervous glances, but hands started to go up. They knew the stakes. This wasn't just about sanctuary anymore. It was about survival, the future of their people. Destin stepped forward first, his eyes filled with determination. I'll go, he said. Bob, leaning against the wall, 
looked over at John with a raised eyebrow and a half smirk. Yeah, well, I'll be happy if our ship's still there at this point. John's expression shifted, his eyes widening slightly as the realization hit him. He hadn't even considered that possibility. If their ship was gone, if Bick and the rest of the crew had already given up on them, a tense silence hung between them with the weight of unspoken fears pressing down. John spoke quietly. We better hope it's still there, because if it's not, he said, trailing off before finishing the thought, unwilling to voice the grim reality of that situation. This is not goodbye, nor the end. Until the story continues, my friends, B and Rocker. <laughs>